right, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Revelation in chapter number 14. Revelation chapter number 14, and after you find Revelation 14, I encourage you maybe to put a bookmark in Matthew in chapter number 13. We'll be looking at a passage there in just a few moments, but we'll begin here in Revelation in chapter number 14, and I am continuing this morning in a message that I actually started last Sunday. Now, I've titled the message, Three Gospels, Three Gospels, and we covered two of them last Sunday, and I want to cover the third one this Sunday. But we understand, of course, and I'm going to repeat something I said last week, we understand there's only one true gospel, amen, and that is the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, that is death, burial, and resurrection, how that uh, Christ bore our sins upon the cross, that he himself became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now that is the true gospel, that is the gospel by which you and I are saved. But the word gospel itself, of course, means good news. And while there is only one true gospel, that is the gospel, uh, some other uh, things can be called in themselves gospels because they are good news. And here in the Revelation, we are presented with some gospels that come to us through angels, angelic beings, ministering spirits that are doing the bidding of God the Father. And so today we're going to look at this third gospel here in Revelation chapter 14. Now many of you, you remember the name of a great old preacher, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Jonathan Edwards preached back in the 1700s and Jonathan Edwards first preached a sermon that became very famous, and you are perhaps even familiar with it today, that he titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He first preached that sermon in 1741. This sermon came about as a result of the first great awakening in the, in, here in America that took place in the 1730s, and it was led by uh, men like Edwards and Charles and John Wesley and George Whitfield and perhaps a few others, and that great awakening resulted in the salvation of thousands and thousands of people here in America. Edwards' message, however, would be considered to be in poor taste in most evangelical churches today. Because in the words of, uh, and I'm kind of paraphrasing this, in the words of a lot of religious figures in our country today, they say that men in that era were very different from men today. And they were preaching to crowds that were far different then than crowds today as if sin is something new today. And they'll say because of the differences in people today, then they disagree with the fact that messages then uh, should be preached today. You know, they and themselves, they believe that messages that Edwards and, and the Wesleys and Whitfield and, and some of the others that they preach then are inappropriate for today. They're not appropriate for our time. Preaching on the subject of personal accountability before a God of wrath and judgment and the very mention of hell in our churches and thus eternal punishment that is all considered to be in poor taste in evangelical churches, let alone any church today. I'll quote to you the words 
of one pastor who said services in our churches today ought to be informal. They ought to have a more informal feeling. He says, you come to my church and you won't, you, you, you won't hear people being threatened with hell. Neither will you hear people referred to as sinners. The goal, he said, at our church is to make people feel welcomed lest we drive them away. Well, don't you wish you had a doctor like that? A doctor you go to? If something's wrong with you, you don't have to worry about him telling you that or giving you some bad news. Why? Because, well, that would be inappropriate. He's not going to refer to any specific disease that you might have. Medicine? Ah! My doctor told me I wouldn't like the taste of it. <laughs> surgery? <laughs> I mean, my doctor said surgery would be far too invasive. But my doctor's a great guy. You know why? Because he always makes me feel welcomed when I come into his office. And regardless, regardless of what might, might be wrong with me, when I leave his office, I always leave feeling good. Isn't that the kind of doctor you want? Now, folks, is the goal of the gospel today to make people feel comfortable? Is the goal of preaching to be so that people don't feel uneasy? See, the gospel is full of uncomfortable truths, isn't it? You know, there's, there's, there's a, really a sad survey that was taken not too long ago. I believe it was taken by the Pew organization as it related to, uh, to people who are training for ministry today and young people who are in our seminaries who are training to be the next generation of leaders in our churches and they found half of them said that preaching about hell is in very poor taste. Well, somewhere along the line, their teachers and their professors have failed to inform them that Jesus had more to say about hell than all the prophets and all the apostles in Scripture combined. The preaching of Jesus by today's standards would be considered in poor taste. Do you imagine in many of these churches, Christian churches they call themselves, Jesus standing in their pulpit and Jesus saying, you generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You're just full of dead men's bones. You're a bunch of whited sepulchers. Boy, that's mean. I mean, who is Jesus to, to go around talking to me like that? I mean, this is a church, for crying out loud. We're Christians. What is Christ doing with all that talk? He's trying to drive people away. This isn't in my notes, but... I'm going to meddle here for a second. You know, you remember, remember that, that rich young ruler who came to Jesus? That rich young ruler came, came to Jesus and, and he wants to know, you know, what am I supposed to do to inherit eternal life and all that? And you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, said sell everything you got. Sell everything you got. Get rid of it all. Now, is Jesus against having, having things? No. What Jesus is trying to warn us of is when things have us. And there's a lot of things that, that have us. And you know what the Bible says about that rich young ruler? And I'll, 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 by today, it was rich young ruler by today, we would call him, and I'm not bad mouth, okay, just, but you know, we'd call him a millennial. He was a, a millennial. But Jesus, by today's standards, he failed this millennial. Why? Because the Bible says that that 
young man went away sorrowful. Sorrowful. Why? Because Jesus was up front with him. Jesus loved him, but Jesus also leveled with him. And today, that sort of preaching is just not seen as appropriate in most evangelical churches. You almost get the impression that Jesus wants people to know uh, the truth about coming judgment. And any gospel that downplays that coming judgment, Jesus said, is another gospel. And we looked last week as... Paul said, though I or, or an angel from heaven, if they come to you and they bring any other gospel, let them be accursed. Let them be eternally damned. Can I tell you something about Jesus that I believe is absolutely true? This is, I believe this is absolutely true. I don't think Jesus is the least bit interested in how comfortable your body is going to feel when they cover you with a white sheet. I don't think Jesus is the least bit interested in designer coffins. The gospel that we are given through Jesus Christ is not about anybody's personal comfort. It's about personal conversion. It's about a personal change. Jesus did not die, and we have not been given the gospel to be saved from poverty, to be saved from your bad back or my bad back, for that matter, or from our low self-esteem. Jesus died, and we have been given the gospel to be redeemed from sin, to be redeemed and saved from eternal condemnation. The wages of sin is still death. Not just physical death, but more importantly to all of us, spiritual death. I'm glad somebody told me about that, aren't you? I'm glad somebody didn't just finish the, you know, stop there, that first part of the verse where the wages of sin is death. I'm glad they went on and told me the rest. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord. Now, in the tribulation, following the rapture of the church, remember again, the church will not have any part in the tribulation, we are gone. We are taken out of here in the moment in the twinkling of an eye when the Lord himself descends from heaven with that shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And I, I'm telling you, I believe that day is getting closer and closer. But in the tribulation time, the gospel is going to go on a world tour And it is going to be preached without apology, without contracts even, without any sponsorship. And it is going to be delivered by three angels. Again, last week we talked about two of those angels and the message that they presented to us. But now we see a third angel who appears and he is going to preach a gospel of of coming judgment. Of coming judgment. Now again... This angel would not be invited to preach in the average American church today. This angel's preaching would make a lot of people mad. It would most certainly offend a lot of people because it would cause these people uh, to leave not feeling so good about their self, not having their sin justified. And and they're going to resolve, well, I am never going back to that church again. Much like a person who goes to a doctor and something's wrong, but they don't like what they hear. And so they resolve, I ain't going back to that doctor anymore. And this is the way it is with our churches. This angel describes hell to us. And he describes it in very vivid detail. 
Now again, last week we expounded on the meaning of the two angels' messages during the tribulation. God is allowing this planet to receive a warning one last time of coming judgment. The earth has been told of the salvation that is being offered through Jesus Christ. Now in the context, the human race is warned that those who follow after the Antichrist, those who follow his false prophet, that they are going to be eternally condemned. And as we'll see, this angel is about to paint a very clear picture of hell itself. In fact, this angel is about to take the lid off of hell and he's about to expose it for everybody to see. And this passage causes a lot, a great deal really, of discomfort among a lot of religious groups today. This is not the kind of preaching that you would ever hear among the Seventh-day Adventists or the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witness, any of those people who come to your door two by two. This kind of message you're never going to hear from the emergent church leaders today who seem to be filling con, uh, you know, these, these coliseums with, with people. They all have trouble dealing with this passage right here. They have to redefine it. They have to recre- create some kind of escape hatch about hell, leading people to believe that after a certain amount of time, there's some escape or else they have to come out and out and out deny it altogether. And so I want us to look at what this third angel has to say about God's coming judgment. About coming judgment. And this is the most serious of the three messages. Notice, first of all, we see God's wrath is promised. God's wrath is promised. Look in verse number 9. In verse 9, it says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in their forehead or in his hands, the same, that is whoever receives his mark, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now John writes, verse 10, that God's wrath that is about to be poured out is like undiluted wine. That it is pure wrath that is about to be poured out upon this earth. And this time only, he said it's not going to be tempered with mercy. You know, I believe today there is is somewhat, there's sort of a small taste of God's wrath that is being poured out on this world. But understand, that wrath is diluted. It is tempered with mercy. It is tempered with a little bit of grace. But this angel says now, during this time, the wrath that is about to be poured out is not tempered with grace or mercy. It is undiluted. And this is a warning for anyone and everyone who follows the Antichrist and who receives his mark. If he had delivered this message to murderers and terrorists and evil dictators and atheists or people who are otherwise just mean, vile, and nasty, then we would say, yeah, they got it coming to them. Yeah, they deserve it. The Hitlers, the Husseins, the Bin Ladens, and those kind of people, they got to be put somewhere, and so they deserve this. However, this warning is for anyone who denies God as creator of all things. I know some really, really good people who claim to be atheists. I know some really, really good, moral, upright people who say there is no God. This is a warning to them as well. This is a warning for anyone who places their faith in false religion. You know what? I know a lot of really, really good people 
who put their faith in false religion. This is for anyone who worships someone else other than Jesus Christ. You see, I know a lot of really, really good people who this morning are worshiping something else other than God. They're worshiping their lake houses. They're worshiping their boats. They're worshiping their very beds that they're still in. They're worshiping their lawns that they're trying to manicure. They are worshiping something else other than the Creator God. This is who this warning is given to. This warning is for the person sitting in your seat right now. This warning is for those individuals standing behind pulpits this morning. Wait a minute now, that that can't be. People believe there is going to be some sort of judgment but you're going to have to come up with something a little more palatable than all this talk about fire and brimstone. I mean, because all of that, preacher, understand in today's world, in today's society, all of that sounds pretty barbaric. This is not only not politically correct, this is not even religiously correct, preacher. And you're just going to drive people away if you start talking about all of that stuff. But the truth is, folks, there are a lot of people who need to be driven away from religion. And they need to be taken to the cross of Jesus Christ for salvation. They need to be taken to the one who bore the wrath of God alone so that they could be delivered from the wrath that they are under. You see, God's wrath is promised. And it's just not promised to those individuals we think it's promised to. It's promised to all who do not worship the God of creation. It is promised to all who worship something or someone else other than Jesus Christ. His wrath is promised. Number two, God's wrath is also seen as being painful. If you look in verse number 10, the latter part of verse 10, it says, and he shall be tormented. Who's the he? The he are those who follow after the Antichrist, who follow the false prophet. It says that person they're going to be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The devil's not going to be the one managing the lake of fire, folks. Get that in your head, (laughs) okay? He's not the one managing the lake of fire. In fact, the devil himself will one day be one of its occupants. And he's not going to be running around hell in a red union suit and terrorizing people with a pitchfork. The devil doesn't look anything like the guy on the can of, of, of deviled ham. As I've told you before, the devil has never been to hell. The devil has never been to hell. He never wants to go there. Hell is under the control of an omnipotent, omniscient God. Do you understand that? Notice the first description in the phrase here. It's fire and brimstone. Now fire we know. We understand something about fire, but what about the brimstone? The word brimstone there actually refers to sulfur. This is a descriptive expression that occurs on six occasions in the Revelation. Six times it is spoken of as fire and brimstone. Sulfur, that's a yellowish element, and when it burns, it burns with a blue flame. And it emits a a toxin. It's very toxic. It's a suffocating type of dioxide gas. Sulfur, get this, Sulfur is found in volcanic regions. And you know, there's a very interesting verse of scripture in Isaiah that says hell 
doth enlarge itself. Hell doth enlarge itself. Now, I can't prove this to you definitively from Scripture. But personally, you know what I believe every time you see a volcano erupting? Do, do, do you know what verse my mind goes to? Where the Bible says, hell doth enlarge itself. That it's making more room for occupants. Imagine being brought to the final judgment. Imagine being condemned to spend eternity in a permanent lake of fire. You see, the Bible says one day that death and hell itself, hell now, we believe, is in the center of the earth. And just as the day came at the resurrection of Jesus when the paradise side was shut up, closed up, so too one day at the end of the thousand years will hell itself be cast into a lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. I don't want to run too far down this rabbit trail, okay, because I'm already getting myself in trouble. But understand this about hell. Hell itself is temporary. Hell is now where the souls of those lost individuals without Christ go. But one day, they will be brought up out of hell. They will stand before God at the great white throne judgment. And then the Bible says they will be cast into the eternal lake of fire, described as a place of outer darkness that burns with fire and brimstone. Now, where that is, we don't know. But it is somewhere out there. And one day, those who stand before Christ that are hopelessly lost will be thrown in a place the Bible describes here as burning with fire and brimstone. The very thought of this endless existence ought to cause anyone, anyone who needs to repent, to repent and turn to Christ for salvation. And this angel is suggesting here that anyone with any sense, if you will, would want to avoid that place. Because this is not a place where you take your chances. Talking about hell and the eternal lake of fire, folks, there's no need for all this bravado. Let me expose some of our ages, okay? Some of us, I'm going to expose how old some of us are. How many of you remember a man by the name of Red Adair? Red Adair, I think we got a picture of him. Some of you may remember him. Red Adair was a famous oil field firefighter. In 1968, John Wayne made a movie about this man that made him, went on to make Red Adair very famous, and the name of the movie was called Hell Fighters. And among his last heroics... Red Adair is one of the individuals that was sent over to Kuwait to help cap many of the fires that Sudan, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein and his army, Iraqi army, when they set them fields on fire, Red Adair uh, was one of the ones sent over there to help put out these fires during the first Gulf War. Red Adair was very brash, very cocky, and somewhat fearless. But in 1991, he joked that things were going to be different. He said, however, when I die. He said, and I'm quoting now, I've made a deal with the devil. The devil is going to give me an air-conditioned place when I go down there so that I won't put out all the fires. Red Adair died in 2004 at the age of 89. I'm sure by now he has discovered that the devil was a liar and can't be trusted. The devil is not in control of hell. Again, the devil has never been there. The devil does not want to go there. 
Hell is under the control and the complete management of a sovereign God who created it. And those who go to hell are in fact sinners in the hands of an angry God. God's wrath will be painful. But notice the third thing with me now. And let's look now at the permanence. The permanence of God's wrath. That God's wrath will be permanent. Look in verse number 11. In verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, again, the specific context of the passage concerns those in the tribulation who choose to reject Christ and choose to follow the Antichrist. And for those who have heard the gospel time and time and time again, just let me say this, and I've told you before, I do not believe those who have been offered salvation will have another chance in the tribulation. That according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Why? Because they believed not the gospel. Believed not, past tense. Because they received not the gospel. That is, they had the opportunity, but chose to reject it. And the Bible says, for this cause, God shall send them a... Who? Those who wouldn't believe the gospel. Those who receive not the gospel. The Bible says, for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they will believe a lie. Preacher, I won't believe it. Listen, God said you will. I believe God. God said those people will believe the lie. They will follow the Antichrist. Now, Again, that's the context. The context uh, is expanded later on in Revelation chapter 20, revealing that everyone who rejects Christ and who rejects the offer of salvation will occupy the place of eternal torment that's mentioned here in verse 14. It's obvious with, that this angel disagrees, that he strongly disagrees with anyone who does not believe in the permanence of hell. And and Jesus speaking in Matthew 25, verse 46, he says, Those who are condemned will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Jesus clearly states that both places are permanent. Where those go who, who go to everlasting life, it's permanent. Those who go to eternal damnation and condemnation, Jesus said, it's permanent. The torment of the lost in hell, or rather who will later be cast into the eternal lake lake of fire, will be as long as the blessedness of those redeemed in heaven. Now I want to quickly, in my time, I want to ask four questions and hopefully answer these four questions very quickly that are relative to the doctrine of eternal wrath. Eternal wrath. And again, this is not the kind of preaching that you will hear in the average evangelical church today. Question number one, are the flames of hell literal flames? Is it literal fire? Now, this is where I need you to go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew in chapter number 13, because I think it's always best to allow the Bible to answer the question. Or we can scramble for another explanation. But I think when the Bible clearly answers the question, then let's let the Bible do so. In Matthew 13, you have the parable of what's known as the wheat and the tares. Jesus gave a figurative meaning to what each element means, to what each element in the parable represents. Again, he gives a figurative meaning, except... For the fire. In verses 37 down through verse 40, he explains that the one who sows the good seed, he says that's the Messiah. He says the field, that's the world. The good seeds 
are the sons of the kingdom. The tares are the sons of the evil one. The enemy who sowed those tares, that's the devil. The reapers are the angels. So it's a parabolic analogy. But then Jesus steps away from the parabolic analogy and notice what he says in verse 41. In verse 41, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. And there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, what he says in verse 43, he asks the question, Are you listening? Everything in the parable has a figurative meaning that he explains what each represents, except for the fire in this place of torment. Why? Because the fire is not figurative. The fire is literal. And so in answer to the question, are the flames of hell literal? The answer is yes. There's a rich man in hell that you can read about there in the Gospel of Luke who will qualify what I'm saying. When the Bible says in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. Question number two. Is the fire literal so that it will consume? If it's literal, will it consume? Now, there's a teaching out there today. It's called annihilationism. Annihilationism is given by those who can't seem to explain away the doctrine of hell. But what it actually does is it it gives us a loophole in the doctrine. Okay, granted, there is a hell. Uh, There's too much said about it. And, you know, there's some who feel like, okay, we can't deny the the, the literal existence of hell and the fire of hell. And so, here's what's going to happen. After a time that people are in hell, after some time, depending on the wickedness of their sin, how much sin they've committed, how evil of a person they were, after a period of time, their soul will be annihilated. Ultimately, they will be consumed by fire to where they are no more. Now, the truth of the matter is, folks, and I want you to understand what I'm saying. The truth of the matter is, I'd almost like to believe that. And I know there's a lot of evil, evil people who have done some of the most horrendous her unimaginable, unthinkable atro- committed those atrocities. And I, I, there's the fleshly side of all of us, and don't look at me pious, because we all think like this. They deserve it. They need to go to hell. And there's that part of us. And I get it because I feel like that way many times. But think about forever. Forever. There is no end to the torment that these people will endure. There is no end. It is forever. Forever lost. 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 Forever. The thought of eternal torment and punishment without end, that is terrible. It's unimaginable, but it's true. 
this angel of revelation makes it perfectly clear that their torment is forever. There is absolutely nothing that implies it is anything but a permanent state, a permanent condition. Just as the body of the believer, of a believer is raised and it is prepared for eternal bliss in a state uh, of heaven, so too is the body of the unbeliever raised and it is prepared for the state it will endure in a lake of fire for all of eternity. You think about it. If the souls of unbelievers were eventually burned up, that this doctrine of annihilationism was true, then what is the purpose of the fire being eternal? What's the purpose of it being forever? The fire is literal. Its purpose is not to consume. Its purpose is to torment. Question number three. Is it really forever? Does forever mean forever? Well, this word forever appears 11 times in the Revelation. Four times, now listen, four times it refers to the eternal existence of God. One time it refers to the eternal existence of Jesus the Son. One time it refers to, the, to God's eternal reign. One time it refers to the eternal glory of the Lamb. One time it refers to the eternal reign of believers. One time it refers to the eternal doom of Satan. Two times it refers to the eternal torment of the lost. What are you saying? What I'm saying is, if God is eternal, and Jesus Christ the Son is eternal, and God's reign is eternal, and the Lamb's glory is eternal, and Satan's doom is eternal, then those who are suffering in hell, it means the same thing. It is eternal. The fourth and final question. Is there no way out of this? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Amen. Yes. I don't mean to ask this question in a, in a facetious way, but people ask, is there a way out of this? Folks, what do you think this book is all about? Yeah, right. Amen. It's about the way out. It's how to avoid all of this. This book gives us the answer to everything that we need to know Amen. about eternity. Right. It may not all answer all the questions we want to know, but brother, it certainly asks, answers all the questions that we need to know. Right. But still, you have... I hesitate to even call them religious writers, but I'll call them a religious writer because... I don't have anything good to say. But the, he was asked, asked the question about how you get to heaven. And, and here's the answer he gave. We can't know who has the right password until we die. The testimony from our own sacred scripture doesn't suffice. One doesn't get the password until after they are dead. Christianity has to deal with the exclusivist claims of John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. But even with this belief, there's theological wiggle room for those who want it. Resolutions will only come when our souls stand before God in judgment after death. What utter foolishness. There is not one verse in Scripture that tells us we get the password after we die. We get it before we die. Listen, folks. Here's the secret password. Jesus! Amen. Jesus! Yes. 
Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Let the blood of Calvary speak for me. It's Jesus. Or it's nothing. Verse 13, John, Revelation 14, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. I mean, how are we blessed when we die? You know how we can be blessed when we die? When we die in the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. We die in the knowledge that Jesus Christ, God's perfect lamb, bore the penalty, paid the debt that that you and I owed. He paid a debt that we all owed. We owed a debt we could never pay. And that is, he is now risen from the dead, alive forevermore. And after we leave this physical body, we can live forever with him. Now the bad news, the wrath of God is promised. Folks, it's coming. Yeah. It is painful. Yeah. And it is permanent. Amen. The good news is the wrath of God is entirely preventable. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. And it is preventable through Jesus Christ, Amen. our Lord. Yeah. Bow your heads with me this morning, if you would.